Good evening, and welcome. It's going to be a long and cold night, so get comfortable and let the darkness take control. I was sitting alone in my car at the local duck pond, eating my lunch and reading a book as usual. Normally I kept my windows open to prevent situations like this from happening, but when I first arrived, no one was around, and it was hot outside, so I rolled them all the way down. I'm not one to waste gas just to have my air conditioning on. I had been going to that pond for lunch almost every single day for the past two years, and had never felt uncomfortable. So surely that day wouldn't be any different. Well, I had just opened my lunch and taken a bite, when this really elderly man, in a red jeep, rolls up beside me. He gets out and roams around the park for a bit before coming over and talking to me. Of course, I'm not going to be rude to the man, since that park is part of a tourist area, and I figured that he was probably either just visiting, or looking for directions, or a retired and lonely guy. We strike up a conversation, and I tell him I'm in school at the local community college, and where I worked. He asked what I did there, and I told him that I was an HVAC apprentice. He said, wow, I used to work on HVAC stuff in the military. I thought it was really cool, and figured that someone with as much experience as him could tell me some pretty useful stuff. If I remember correctly, he did tell me some things that would be pretty useful, but the conversation quickly became predatory and I was shocked at how quickly the conversation turned south and made me forget what he told me. He asked me how old I was. I told him I was 18, and he told me he was 52. Although the guy looked like he was in his 90s at his youngest. But whatever I figured. A lot of military people get really heavy into drugs and alcohol, so maybe that aged him a lot. He asked if I had a boyfriend, Nope. He said he had a wife, but that he cheated on her a lot, and a couple of kids who didn't like him. Well, that's a kind of deep thing to admit to a stranger, but if he's comfortable with sharing it, then I'm totally fine with it. He kept on going about how much he loved women, and how he just couldn't help himself when he cheated on his wife. Then he asked me if I was a virgin. By this point, I had already started picking up bad vibes from the guy, and really no matter what I told him, it was going to be a lose-lose situation. I was afraid that if I told him I wasn't a virgin, he'd think that I was loose and that I'd do whatever he wanted to me. So I went with virgin, hoping that it would imply that I'm prude and he'd give up on me. Instead, the creepy old man seemed to get off on the thought of seducing an 18-year-old virgin. I tried multiple times to steer the conversation away from sex, but he kept bringing it back up. He asked if I masturbated, watched porn, ever wanted to have sex at all. I said no, in an effort to really hit the prude ball home. I figured that he was just from an older generation, that thought you had to convince women to go out with them, and that once he realised I was serious, he would give up, because no one wants to be a rapist, right? Nope. I was already really uncomfortable with this guy, but then the threat started. He kept saying that if I hung out with him, that I wouldn't stay a virgin long. He'd just say that over and over again, very firmly like he knew he wasn't going to give me a choice in the matter. Then I realised that I was completely alone in the park with this guy. No security cameras were anywhere. No one knew I went to that pond for lunch every day. You might be asking yourself, why didn't you just turn your car on and leave? 
Well, I had stupidly thrown my keys into the passenger seat. I was afraid that by the time I reached the keys, pulled them in the ignition and turned them on, this old guy would have easily climbed in through the window and would be fighting me for control of the vehicle. I continued on with a polite conversation, pretending to be unaware of his motives and ignorant to any sexual references he made. I just had to wait for the right moment, for him to sneeze, look away, let his guard down, so that I could grab my keys from the passenger seat and get out of there. Luckily for me, a school bus full of children came right when I thought I was going to have to fight this guy tooth and nail to get him to leave me alone. As soon as he saw them arrive, he looked really freaked out and then disappointed, like he knew that he had just lost his catch. There were too many witnesses now, too many people who might intervene and would most likely secure double jail time for doing so many things whilst being around a bus full of children. He said bye to me in a normal manner and said that he would look out for me again in the park, then hopped into his red jeep and took off. If worse had come to worst, I think I could have taken the guy in a fight. He may have been ex-military, but he looked like hell, like a strong breeze could just about break his bones. I'm glad I didn't have to fight him though, because I believe it was his intention to go out that day and find someone to rape. He also could have carried a concealed weapon somewhere. Needless to say, I avoided the park for the next month or so, and once I did return, I was really paranoid that I might see him again. Honestly, be careful about how much information you reveal about yourself to strangers. In the course of 45 minutes, I had given this guy enough information to track me down if he had really wanted to. He knew which school I went to, which program I was on and where I worked, my name, my age, my date of birth, and he could have easily written down my number plate. Just remember to be savvy and stay safe. When I was younger, I spent a good portion of my time chatting online to friends and strangers in chat rooms. Whenever I would stay with my friend Chelsea, we would be up all night on AIM and Yahoo Chat. It wasn't unusual for us to get completely random messages on AIM. You could easily type in any random name and location and search for people. So we would even add random people ourselves occasionally to chat. At some point, Chelsea began getting messages from a random guy, NC guy 991. At the time, I was around 12 years old, making Chelsea roughly around 13 or 14. We both had countless internet friends with random weird people who talked to us constantly. We would even sometimes go to chat rooms and say we were younger than we actually were to see what kind of freaks were out there. Then we'd call them out on being paedophiles and tell them that we were actually 20. It was something of a game to us. When I saw that Chelsea had been speaking to NC guy 911, I didn't think much of it. I noticed he messaged her quite a lot even when we were busy watching the hamster dance and not paying attention to our chat buddies. I ended up asking her about him, and she confessed that she was actually really creeped out by him, and he wouldn't leave her alone. It was unusual for either of us to get creeped out by anyone. We knew what kind of people were out there, and we knew that it was as simple as saying, piss off you disgusting paedophile to make the person on the other end feel ashamed and back off. However, this guy managed to get into her head. They started talking innocently enough. He randomly messaged her on AIM and said that he was visiting his niece and looking for people to chat to since he was often home by himself whilst the family were at work and school. We thought that NC guy meant nice guy but it was North Carolina, which is where he was from. 
We both loved talking to new people, so Chelsea jumped at the chance to speak with him. She was suffering from depression at the time and had very low self-esteem and had been cutting herself. She got talking to the guy so much out of boredom that she ended up confiding in him late at night. After formatting some form of trust and knowing each other's age, Chelsea being 14 and he being 48, the questions began getting more personal. He would ask her if she'd ever had a boyfriend, what bra size she wore, and if she touched herself. Any other time, she would have told a person like this to go kill themselves. I wonder why she hadn't. I had the guy myself so I could find out what was going on with him. It didn't take the guy very long to start with his perverted questions towards me. Unlike Chelsea, I went off on him and told him what he's doing was illegal and disgusting. He would only respond by saying, Hey, I'm just chatting here. I have a niece your age in school. To which I would respond, That's unfortunate for your niece. Are you trying to molest her too? He started telling me that I was a bad little girl and that he was going to punish me. He made me really uncomfortable, but for the most part I laughed it off and told him that he's disgusting. I asked Chelsea why she kept this guy on her list and why she would talk to someone like that for so long. She told me that whilst chatting to him at one point, he told her that he would be on his way to visit his niece. He picked up a 15 year old prostitute and he described the encounter in graphic detail and laughed about the girl being in tears, trying to get home. Chelsea was really creeped out by this, almost feeling like the guy had violated her because she was around the same age as that girl. She told him that she didn't want to chat anymore because the stuff he'd been saying was creepy as shit. He got angry with her for telling him that they didn't want to be friends anymore. And he also said that he was going to be punishing her if she refused to chat. I convinced her to stop talking to him completely and that it was an empty threat. He was just some freak trying to intimidate young girls. She ignored him for about two weeks. He tried to message her a couple of times but not in an obsessive manner. So I guess that's why she didn't go to the extent of blocking him. However, on what was supposed to be the last night staying with his niece, she received a message from him. She said that she assumed it was going to be goodbye, but when she opened the message, it was an image file. It was a pretty large image, so scrolling from bottom to top, all we saw was dead, dry grass and leaves. We were a bit shaken up, thinking it was going to be a dead body he dumped or something. But when we zoomed out, it became clear. It was a picture of her house, from beside a grassy area next to her old swing set. We blocked him and got new screen names, and stopped going into chat rooms after that. We were terrified, but at the same time, we didn't want to get into trouble. So we didn't tell our parents what happened. Chelsea had already gotten into trouble before for telling random strangers that she wanted to kill herself and the police showed up at her house. She wasn't supposed to be online at all. We liked to think that it was just some idiot we knew personally who knew where we were and wanted to mess with us. But I really don't think that was the case. Either way, we never heard from him again. It was fifth period, which is right after lunch, and I was sitting in my geography class, which was actually located in a small room inside the library because of overcrowding. Class had just started when the intercom came on and the principal's voice shaking yelled, this is a lockdown situation. This is not a drill. This is a lockdown situation. You could hear the commotion in the background. Everyone freaked out. We were really confused because how could something happen at our school when a shooting had just happened at a neighboring school a month before? 
My teacher ran over and locked the door. The room didn't have any windows to the outside. Just one that looked into the library, since we were in a room within a room. He just kept telling us to stay calm. We kept asking about what was happening, but he didn't know any more than we did. Some time passed. We heard helicopters above, but nothing else. Some kids were freaking out and crying. Others were trying to distract themselves, but mostly, everyone was sitting on their desks or on the floor silently. I sat on the floor and kept looking at the doors imagining someone busting through and killing me. I kept thinking that I didn't want to die, but I was convinced I was about to. Since I was in the library, I kept thinking back to Columbine, and I thought I would be the first target. I have never felt fear like that before. After a while, my teacher went through a side door into the librarian's office. We could hear that a TV or radio was on, and I think they were watching slash listening to the news coverage of whatever was happening. Then he came back, and we asked to know what was happening, but he wouldn't tell us. He just told us to stay calm, and then put on the Karate Kid movie. I was pissed, but in retrospect, I could understand why he didn't tell us. More time went past, and then my teacher told us after a phone call that it would be safe to leave, and a SWAT team would be coming through to clear out the rooms and escort us to safety. He said to drop all our things and stand with our hands on the top of our heads. We did, and then the door opened and the SWAT officers were pointing rifles at us with one line of other officers doing the same thing behind him. They entered the room, looked, searched around, and then ordered us to walk out single file with our hands on our heads. We did. As I was walking out crying, I smiled at an officer and said thank you. He nodded and winked. They escorted us to the park across the street where our parents were waiting. Since only a few kids had cell phones, we had to just wander around until we found them. As I was sobbing and looking for my parents, there were news reporters and cameras approaching me and the other kids, asking questions. I ignored them, but I am still disgusted by that. I should have punched them in their face. It should be illegal to approach children for interviews after shit like that. I finally found my parents and started sobbing. We hugged and they explained what had happened as they drove me home, as they're both cops. It turned out that a kid had brought in a shotgun and shot at the administration office window and at students and teachers around it. Luckily, there was a police officer on campus at the time because of the shooting at the other school a few weeks ago. He immediately confronted the shooter and shot him in the face and buttocks, and then he was taken into custody. I believe it all happened in the span of a few minutes. Nobody died, but five people were injured, but none seriously. When I got home, I turned on the TV. They had identified the shooter. It was a senior I had sat next to in class for an entire semester. We worked on projects together. He was definitely an outcast, and I thought he was kind of weird, but I didn't think he would do something like that. I talked to him a fair amount in class. He did get really angry very quickly over small things, like if he did badly on a test or something. Instead of dropping it, he'd curse and throw his pencil around and act as if it were the end of the world, and not speak to anyone for the rest of the day. Sometimes he would come to class and just look super pissed off and not talk to anyone all day. Other days he'd be really nice to me, and we'd strike up conversations. Looking back, I think he may have had a crush on me. I remember one time correcting his test and signed my name at the bottom. I always dotted my eyes with hearts, and he asked, is that heart for me? I laughed and said no. He didn't talk to me for the rest of class that day. He ended up hanging himself in jail before his trial ended. It came out that he had been abused his whole life and had just been rejected from the military before he did the shooting. I had nightmares for years about him killing himself. 
I cried about it sometimes. I always wondered if there was something that I could have said or done to stop him from doing what he did. I also wondered if he would have come to my class, if he would have shot me or spared me. A lot of people immediately hated him and wished the cop would have killed him on the spot instead of just wounding him. But I don't. I wish he would have had a better life, or at least served time and found peace and became a better person. I know he wasn't an evil person. There was good inside him. He just needed help and didn't get it. I graduated from high school in 2009. At the time, I was working at a locally owned grocer store as a cashier. All of the cashiers were girls, and all of the stockers slash bag boys were guys. I remember one day a new guy started, and I thought he was so cute. I flirted with a lot of the guys, as they were all around my age, and I specifically started paying attention to him. He seemed really young, and had somewhat of a baby face and freckles. Once we started talking, I found out that he was 28, 10 years my senior. However, me just having graduated from high school and living in my own apartment for the first time, I decided to go for it. We started dating, and it got serious very quickly. He was a talented drummer and bassist, and seemingly very caring and a passionate individual, attempting to get his undergraduate degree at 28 in music while supporting himself. I felt sorry for him in a lot of ways. He'd been raised by a single mother, who never gave him the love and stability that he needed. He had pretty severe ADHD and had dropped out of school after repeating the ninth grade twice. He had a really rough start, and was fairly emotionally immature for a 28 year old. I had never spent so much time with someone, and given them so much of myself, emotionally and mentally. He was basically a wreck in a lot of ways, and I tried to help him out as much as I could being an 18 year old at the time and still living off my parents. We dated for about eight months, spending every night together. The longer the relationship progressed, the more jealous, possessive and protective he became. He needed constant reminders that I was interested in him and questioned every interaction I had with other men. For example, I had a close friend that lived in the neighborhood, and I walked to his house from my ex's one day. He, thinking that I had been gone too long, and was most likely cheating on him with the other guy, my ex literally runs down the street and bursts into the door of my friend's house, out of breath and demanding to know what's going on. For some reason, we kept dating despite this growing jealousy, at least for a bit. It wasn't until after he flunked out of college and was faced with having to move back in with his grandmother that I finally threw in the towel. I felt it was getting too intense and didn't want to have to keep dating him anymore. My parents hated him and he had creeped out most of my friends at this point. But of course, it was hard for me to let go. I still felt close to him, and it was hard to leave. He seemed so pitiful after I broke it off, showing up at a mutual friend's house whilst I was there, texting me sad things, etc. It was just hard to distance myself. But this is when all the creepiness truly begins. I had moved back in with my parents, and he started showing up unannounced at their house more than a few times. He just wanted to talk, apparently. I had a crappy car at the time, and the passenger side door didn't unlock from the outside. So I left it unlocked 
a lot. I began to find teddy bears, bouquets of flowers, cards, weed, all left as gifts. He texted me constantly, drove past my house at night to check if I was there. If I wasn't, he would call incessantly until I answered. If I didn't, he would leave nasty voicemails. I started casually seeing another guy, a friend of mine from high school. And one night, when I was at his house quite late, my ex managed to track me down and made a scene in the parking lot outside my friend's apartment. He was screaming that I was a slut and a liar. How could I break his heart? My friend's roommate went outside and subdued him, and he eventually went away. A few nights later, I was working at my current job waitressing at a pizza place. My ex came in whilst I was working and started a scene with me in front of everyone, yelling at me and call me names. My managers had to escort him out and told him that he was forever banned from coming into the premises. When I clocked off, I had someone walk out with me, but when I got to my car, he had keyed the shit out of it. There were lines up and down the sides of the car, and he had scratched the word slut into the windshields and rearview mirrors. It was extremely upsetting and embarrassing. Of course, I went home and told my parents about it. My father is a criminal defense lawyer and called up some cop acquaintances of his and asked them to please go speak with my ex. However, due to some technicality, I suppose, there was nothing that they could do except ask him to stay away from me. However, the abusive texts and hateful voicemails did not stop. They got worse. The phone company couldn't block him from sending me messages, apparently. And then he hacked my Facebook. It was getting unbearable. Being 19 and stupid, I decided that if he thinks he really loves me, that he'd stop harassing me if I confront him like adults. I go to his grandmother's house and see that she's not there. At first, we just talk, but it became an argument very quickly. He told me that he had cheated on me with a mutual acquaintance whilst we were together and had contracted herpes and as a result, given it to me. I slapped him and he grabbed me by the hair and pulled me to the ground and proceeded to choke me. I remember pulling his hair as hard as I could, screaming and biting and finally squirming away and running out the door. He ran after me. I got in my car and locked the door. It was so scary seeing him pull on my car, crying and screaming at me. I tried to get my shit together and pulled away. About two weeks later, I got my restraining order against him. It was good for 10 years, but he didn't even show up to the court proceedings. I have seen him still from afar a few times, but thankfully, it is three years later, and I haven't heard from him whatsoever. Also, he didn't really give me herpes. I'm just so glad that it's all over now. I am a cosplayer. I'm not famous, but well enough known in my city to be recognized once in a while. A while ago, there was an incident that happened to me where three men tried to attack me on a train. And since then, I've rarely taken the train unaccompanied, but sometimes I had to. I'd prefer to be able to drive everywhere, but parking in my city is one of the most expensive in Canada. And I'm a freelance photographer by profession and can't always afford to pay $30 for a couple of hours downtown. So I take the train. My boyfriend had stayed at a friend's the night before and would be meeting me on the other side of town to take me to the photo shoot. I was dressed as Misa Amane from Death Note, and I was taking the train to meet up with the cosplayer who would be light. I was dressed as Misa 
but I was wearing a coat over my outfit and regular shoes. So besides my big false lashes and the hem of my skirt, there was nothing to indicate that I was cosplaying at all. It was around 5.30 a.m. We were driving to the next town over for the shoot, so we had to get started early. It was Saturday morning, so most people on the train were those heading home from an overnight shift. I actually really like the early hours, because usually no one gives me a hard time or even speaks to me. So anyway, I had to ride from the second last stop in the northwest corner, all the way to the final station in the southwest corner. So the train crossed half the city. A man got on downtown, six stops until I got off. My light had texted me, saying that he was already there. Though there were many empty seats, a man got on and he chose to sit directly in front of me. Hey, he said. I hadn't had any coffee and wasn't up for conversation, so I didn't respond. I pretended not to hear him and kept scrolling through Facebook. Hey, he said louder. I glanced up at him. You're really pretty, he said. I didn't respond verbally. I just nodded slightly to acknowledge that I'd heard him. To be honest, I would consider myself a little pretty. I'm not skinny or even super fit, though I'm not overly heavy anymore. But I do think I have some attractive features. I'm used to people telling me that I'm pretty especially when I've done a full face of makeup for my photo shoot. Did you hear me? I said you look really hot. His voice was irritated. I heard you. Yeah, I'm pretty. I responded. I was feeling irritable because he started to talk to me, and I didn't feel like stating something that were true needed to be thanked. You're not that pretty. Vain bitches like you should be taught a lesson. I've gotten this reaction before from men, usually online or from catcallers. There's an idea that some people have of you that you're only what they say you are. They don't want women to know that they're beautiful unless a man says they are. I rolled my eyes and went back to looking at my phone. Four stops left. I knew that after the next stop there would be a long portion through a tunnel. The lights were on in the train, so I wasn't worried about him doing anything scary. I should cut that pretty face. A few other passengers had looked up at this point. The guy was speaking loudly, and I was a little nervous. Three stops left. A few people got on the train. The last stop downtown. The guy leaned towards me across the train. I'm going to stab you up when you get off this train. After my last horrifying experience on a train, this made me really nervous. The guy cosplaying as Light didn't have a car, so we'd be walking to the mall 10 minutes away to wait for my boyfriend. Light's not a big guy. He's an inch shorter than me, actually. Fight me, I said quietly. I don't know why, but I have a tendency to act stupid and tough when I'm afraid. This guy was bigger than me, and he could probably kill me with little difficulty. But it was now 5.45am, and I was grouchy and had not had coffee. I'm going to break your neck and cut your face off, he said loudly. We were passing through the tunnel. The train is always very loud in the tunnel, and I don't think any other passengers could hear him. We get out the tunnel and approach the next stop. This is the last one before I have to get off. At the stop... Most people get off the train. Besides me and the threatening guy, there are only two other people on the train. A big guy with headphones on, and a little old lady. Back off, man. My boyfriend's waiting for me at the station. I lie. I wish I'd chosen to sit near a door. I'm scared that if I try and get up to call the emergency call button, he'll attack me. No one would want a fat shit like you. But don't worry. I like them fat. He said this loudly. I'm 150 pounds and 5 foot 6. I'm slightly overweight, but I work out and have healthy eating habits, 
so my doctor isn't worried. This all? I heard someone say it loudly. It was the big guy with headphones. This all is the name I use when I'm cosplaying. I thought that was you. What are you doing up so early? He walked over to where I was sitting and sat down next to me. I didn't recognize him, but I realized that he heard what the guy had been saying to me and came to defend me. Just meeting up with my friends, I was trying to keep my voice cheerful. I'm careful to avoid looking at the guy across from us. Oh, nice. I'm just getting off from work. Where are you going? He asks. Next stop, I reply. No kidding, me too. The guy across from us leans back in his seat, though he's still glaring at us. When we get to the next stop, the big guy gets off the train with me. We meet with my friend and walk up to the mall. The creepy guy followed us for a few blocks and then disappeared. I was still afraid, so the guy waited with us until my boyfriend arrived. We ended up giving him a lift home because his stop was actually about five further down the line. I don't know if the creep on the train would have actually hurt me, but I'm glad I didn't have to find out. So creep on the train. Let's not meet again. And headphones guy, I'll see you at the next convention. In sixth grade, my maths class was located in a first floor classroom, maybe 30 feet from the main entrance to the school. On this particular day, we had a substitute teacher. About halfway through the class, an announcement comes over the PA system. Attention all teachers, please bring your grade books to the principal's office immediately. It is apparent that our renter teacher was confused. My classmates and I look around at each other confused, and we all collectively arrive at, well, what? We were all so confused. So we all did the logical thing, and figured out we should help the substitute teacher find our actual teacher's gradebook, so the sub can take it to the office. Hey, they made an announcement about it and the principal was involved. I'm not going to be that guy that argues. The door to the classroom is open. No one is being quiet. And about half our class is standing, milling around in full view of the first floor windows that look onto our town's one major road. The gradebook, however, still eludes us. We can't find anything on the desk or anything inside the drawers. We look inside the teacher's closet, but there's really nothing there. So we give up. The substitute now frazzled, and by our estimation late for her date with the principal, grabs the planner and her notes from the day, and leaves the room, heading towards the office on the other side of the hall. We are a loud buzzing mass of sixth graders, in the open-doored classroom closest to the main entrance of the building, and we are now lacking in supervision. At the time the buzzer sounds, all the periods end, we're still confused. Should we leave? I peek out into the hallway and notice that no other classes have been dismissed yet. And then, I see her. Our substitute, replete with old lady printed dress, thick trim glasses and heels, is positively galloping down the hall towards the room, waving at me frantically to get back inside. Something, it seems, is amiss. Red-faced and panting, Having dropped her planner somewhere in the hundred yard dash, she gets back into the room and slams the door shut. With all semblance of secrecy long blown, substitute bot 9000 just says, there is a suspected murderer somewhere within the mile radius of the school. Get away from the windows, we're turning off the lights, all be quiet, this is not a drill. We oblige. An hour of tense and awkward silence later, we're given the all clear. The guy had been picked up by local police and we were out of danger. Needless to say, the lockdown code was revised after that particular incident. So I grew up as a middle class suburban dweeb. Middle son in a waspy family in a mostly stable home. Like many such children, I was left to my own devices quite a bit. 
when the first modem made its way into the house, along with AOL, I was hooked on the chat rooms. That was a pretty momentous occasion for me. Let me explain. I was a sexually precarious child. Before my teens, I was already desperate for it, despite not knowing what it actually meant. There wasn't really an outlet for it though, so it mostly meant me spending huge amounts of time alone in the room, thinking abstractly about the topic. When chat rooms became available, I entered the equation, because it gave me a wealth of people to talk about the topic with, and I was basically addicted. I would lurk in sexually explicit chat rooms for hours on end. After years of being a lurker, casually observing the discourse in the chat rooms, I started participating. Being the internet, it was mostly men, but I was crazed, and there was attention. I began to have pretty lucid chats, leading to cybersex. That was the days before the proliferation of digital cameras, or even scanners, so it was strictly text. I went on for a little while, in the generic hookup style chat rooms, I'd cyber with anyone who came my way. When they'd inevitably ask for my location, I'd give a suburb about 30 or 40 minutes away from where I really was. Until one day, I remember very clearly I'd been cybering with one guy in his late teens, only a handful of years older than me. When he asked where I lived, I lied, and returned the question to him. He replied that he lived in the suburb that I actually lived in. I confessed my lie, saying that I'd only lied to keep creepers away, and he commended me for the clever idea. And so it got to be that I'd cyber with this guy every couple of days. He'd ask me about phone sex, but I didn't want to get a call on my parents' line. Our sessions turned into discussions of what we would do if we met up. He said he knew the perfect place we could play in his car, and asked where a safe spot could be so that he could pick me up. I mentioned a park that was several blocks away. Things continued this way, strictly in the realm of fantasy for a while. Eventually though, I started to lose interest. I wouldn't sign on for weeks at a time, then months, and then whenever I did, he would be there, ready to pick up where I left off. I was usually willing to oblige, because it was all just harmless idle fantasy. Years later, I'd all but forgotten about my account. We didn't have AOL anymore, and I'd made a newer account on my AIM. About five years after all of this had started, I was moving into my college dorm and setting up my new laptop when I remembered my old handle and signed back in. It had been years since I'd last signed on. Surely enough, who I am's me first, but my old friend. He asked me what I've up to, and I told him that I've moved. Ah, oh, shucks, he replies. We never did meet up. Yeah, I said. Bummer. It's a shame that date didn't work out. What date, I ask? We were going to meet in Walgreens on your block, but you chickened out. I replied, oh, I don't think I remember that. I was racking my brains to recall such an event. There was in fact a Walgreens on my block, but it was relatively new. We were going to meet in the parking lot, but you drove away before I could talk to you. I assured him he was mistaken, as I hadn't spoken to him since I'd gotten my license. No man, for real, you were going to meet me in that black Ford Focus with the bike rack and the alien sticker on the back. The room seemed to swim. I felt like I was falling backwards. He correctly identified the car I was driving, but I'd never told him about it, nor mentioned the tiny details, nor sent him a picture that included my face. I'd sure I'd never set anything up. Was he deliberately messing with me? Just trying to let me know that he'd found me? Or had the years since this happened twisted my mind? Had he convinced himself that him stalking me was a meeting we'd arranged? I blocked him and tried to forget about it. I wasn't living in the same town anymore. And even though his stalking prowess was apparently good, I was a significant distance away, and a pretty athletic guy. If he found me again, I didn't think I'd have much to worry about. 
I'd nearly forgotten about the whole thing until the other day. This was well over a decade later at this point. My older brother and I were catching up, lamenting getting older. I told him that there was an old member of my graduating class that had already gone to jail for a felony and served his time. This led to a discussion about friends, classmates and such who had been arrested. He led with, remember Charles? I played football with him. He was arresting for sexing up kids he met online. Crazy! I looked at the case. He'd been tried and convicted for a slew of sex crimes. He had apparently been using the social sites like Zanga, MySpace and Friendster to meet young boys. He blackmailed and assaulted some of them when they wanted to break it off. The more I read, the more I got a heavy feeling in my stomach. I googled his AIM handle. It wasn't terribly unique. There were similar accounts named on all sorts of sites, which were definitely not him. But one, deeper in the results, was an account on a rollerblading forum. Skimming this account's post, I was positive it was the same person I'd been chatting with. Clicking the user profile statistics page, the last login was precisely the day before my brother's friend was arrested. At this point, I have more questions than answers. Could it really have been him? If it was, was it random chance? Did he know me through my brother? Is that how he was able to put a face to a name? Was he waiting in my neighborhood on purpose? Or was it coincidence? I went to an inner city school. And for us, lockdowns were a regular thing. They happened several times per year, but they were never serious, except one. It was my junior year, and at the end of the previous school day, a text started spreading around the school. It read something to the effect of, High school students, be careful. Tomorrow is going to get interesting. The Blue Rules gang are going to spray. I didn't think much of it, even though it was a fairly odd happening. Apparently overnight, the message spread to some members of the school administrators. I arrived at school the next day, and there was a palpable tension in the air. I went to my first class as usual, and on my way through, I noticed a few more police officers than I was used to. I arrived to my first class of the day, and the school bell rang. Our teacher began class by alerting us all to the fact that the text message had been copied into a school email and spread to all the teachers and faculty, and that there was a large police presence at and around the school. One kid asked how big it was. The teacher then informed us that there were officers forming a tight perimeter around the school, and that there was an entire SWAT team split between the roof and the lower levels. My first class ended with nothing happening, and I made my way to my second. About 20 to 25 minutes into class, a voice came over the intercom. Students, listen carefully. The red folder made it back to the front office. Thank you so much for participating. The students and teachers sprang into action. At my school, if something was going wrong in the area and we were on lockdown, the folder was yellow. If the trouble is in the immediate area or on the school grounds, the folder was red. If the problem was in the building, the folder was black. It was our code to keep the intruders guessing or something like that. But the folder was red, and we wondered what the hell was going on. We all gathered in the corner of a dark room on the same side as the door to make sure that we could hardly be seen. People were frantically looking at their smartphones to see if there were any news updates, which of course there were not. We were stuck there for about two and a half hours whilst the police had a standoff with the gang members who had showed up at the school. They were all arrested, and then everyone was released. We are so lucky that nothing serious happened, and that we were warned beforehand. So a couple of years ago, I was in a god-awful relationship with a girl who I knew had borderline personality disorder and was a complete immoral bitch. Every morning, 
I would run a mile from my house to hers and prop my body in the window to her room, then leave when she let me. On one of these return trips, I was running back home on a freezing winter night whilst being on the phone with her. Recently, my family had been showing some serious concern for me, telling me how dangerous the streets were and how many people died. I ignored them, of course, because this girl had me wrapped around her finger. So I'm running. It's dark and freezing. In my ear is a usual blend of insults and arguing. When I hear someone yell, Hey, yo, who's that? I stopped and turned and saw somebody walking from their driveway, eyeballing me suspiciously. I held my palms in the air as a universal sign for I'm harmless and said, nobody, before resuming my jog home. As I cleared the street, I heard the same man, this time more hostile. Come here. I ignored him, figuring he was just going to mug me, wasting both of our time as I was broke. He kept calling me, pursuing me through several streets until he changed his yell. Again, I ignored him, but I stopped because I was out of breath from running in the cold. Then I heard two loud bangs from behind me. I never believed anyone when they said that the world slows down if you're frightened or worked up enough. But I found this to be true immediately. My brain jumped to attention as I put together what just happened. I felt a dull sting on my hip and smelt something. I only remembered smelling from when being near sparklers or near fireworks. I screamed holy shit at the top of my lungs before desperately sprinting faster than I've ever moved in my entire life. I tripped over some construction debris, but somehow managed to roll or scramble straight into another sprint as I heard bang after bang erupt behind me. My phone flew out of my hand and down the street at some point. I saw a police car and desperately waved my hands and screeched, help me as loud as my lungs allowed, only to watch them take off after a van that fled the gunshots when I did. I got home and saw a line scooped out of my hip and realized that I'd have died if I'd have moved an inch differently. I never found out why somebody felt the need to empty their gun in an attempt to kill some poor bastard in a really messed up relationship. But I learned a thing or two from that night. I dumped her shortly after. I don't like to tell people about my life and the things I've experienced because I have anxiety, especially related to interacting with other people. I've only told this to a few people outside my immediate family and I've only recently just started talking about it. I wish I'd told someone sooner as I discovered a co-worker encountered these men as well. But talking about it now does seem therapeutic. Anyway, this is my story. I worked downtown, standard 8am to 5pm work shift. Once in a while I worked overtime, but not often, and not on the day that this happened. It was just a couple of minutes after 5pm when I left work. It's just a few blocks from my office building to the train station. There are a few bars and back alleys along the walk, but the worst I've ever dealt with are a few homeless folk who get a little aggressive asking for cash. They don't bother me much. The train ride from the station to downtown, where I park my car, is about 40 minutes. If I'm lucky I manage to get a seat, I don't have to spend the whole ride standing. On that day I was lucky, more or less. I got a seat next to a window, which left the seat next to mine open. At the next stop, three men got in. One of them sat next to me, and the others sat from the seat across, so that they were facing me. I was listening to music on my iPod, so I couldn't really hear them. 
However, I did notice that the guy sitting next to me was trying to move closer to me on the seat. He would move close enough so that his leg was touching mine. So I'd scoot away and then he would move closer again. Eventually I was pressed right against the window and had no doubt that he had more than a few inches of free space on his side. I was wearing sunglasses and could surreptitiously glance at them. I'd noticed that they would occasionally say something and then look at me. It was incredibly creepy and uncomfortable. I was nervous about getting off at my stop but mine is the second to last on the train line. So when the train pulled into my station, I got off. The guy sitting next to me tried to grab my arm, but I was moving away and quickly was able to get out. I was hoping they wouldn't get off the train there. It was a busy station and they couldn't have known where I was parked, but they did. I guess it was their luck that they targeted me. I park in the furthest lot from the station because the parking there is free. It's about a seven minute walk, which isn't usually too bad. But my lot tends to be pretty quiet, and I was really worried that these guys were following me. A bit of background. I was fat. I worked in an office job and was sitting down all day and not working out. Add that to my strong sweet tooth, and you've got a recipe for a bad body. I was about 30 pounds overweight and probably couldn't run more than 30 seconds. Sad, considering that I ran track and played hockey in high school. I still play hockey, but on a women's day league and it's not really that competitive. I'm the youngest on my team, about 20 years old, but my mum is on the team and it's something that we do for fun together. I was crossing the bridge over the road from the station to the parking lot when I noticed the three guys less than 10 feet behind me. I wasn't carrying a knife, although I do own a legal sized knife, nor any pepper spray because it's illegal in my Canadian city. I know a little bit about personal protection though, a required class for girls at my private high school that I attended in my youth. So I put my house key between my fingers if I needed to hit someone with it, because it would hurt them at least a little bit. The guys followed me across the main lot. They didn't hide the fact that they were there, and the more nervous I was, the louder they laughed. I managed to get across the road between the lots before they got to the road. They had to wait for a couple of cars to pass before they could cross. I was almost halfway across the lot when they crossed the road, and I started to run. I could hear their feet pounding the pavement behind me. I used my clicker to unlock the car when I was close, and I wrenched the door open. I'm so glad that there was no one parked next to me. I had barely closed my door and slammed the lock when the guy reached for my car. They were banging on the window and yelling, jeering. I'd never been so afraid in my life. I was worried they'd break the window and get in. There was a guy in the back, banging the back of my hatchback so I couldn't reverse out my spot without running him over. I should have. But I was afraid and not thinking. I was screaming, but no one was around to hear me. I don't know what they wanted, but I knew it wasn't anything good. I wished I had the screaming my mum had given me for protection, but it needed a new battery, so I didn't bring it along with me. That thought, the one about the screamer, made me realise I had something even better. When you're being assaulted, you're not supposed to scream for help. No one wants to help you. You scream fire because everyone wants to watch the blaze. So I turned on my car alarm. It was incredibly loud in my car. So loud I thought I would go deaf, but it got the reaction I wanted. The guy started backing off. I saw people walking into the lot, looking into the direction of my car. People could see what was going on. The guys took off back towards the train station and I drove home crying. The next night I started working out. I have worked out almost every day since then. If those cars hadn't been on the road at that time, if I'd have run just a little slower, if I had been too slow in clicking the lock, it could have all ended very differently. I've lost 20 pounds since then and have gained a great amount of muscle.
I quit my job. I've had anxiety issues for years, and this encounter made it so much worse. I never want to feel powerless again. A few years back, I went to a fairly small school in the Midwest slash Great Lakes area. I started my day pretty much like usual. I went to the cafeteria and got a muffin. Unknowingly, walking right by the table of the shooting. I was running a bit late, so the bell had rung a while before I'd even left the cafeteria. I made it about halfway to class, when I heard a couple of loud pops and some screams and stuff. I headed back towards the cafeteria, thinking someone had set off a firecracker. I made it pretty close before I noticed that people were still running and screaming. I was in a hallway that formed a T intersection with the hallway that led to the cafeteria. I was maybe 20 feet away when I saw a kid I knew go running past the end of the hallway, chased by the gunman. He got shot, got up, and kept running. The gunman shot again a few times, but by then I was sprinting back to my AP history class. The kid I saw survived, but he will never walk again. Three other kids died from an execution-style gunshot to the back of the head. I later learned that I had actually walked by the table about a minute before. I made it back to my classroom just when the PA system announced the lockdown. I told the teacher what happened. He was an ex-marine, non-combat, but he was still solid. Six for eight dude. He stood up and went to the wall locker and pulled out a baseball bat and told us to get into a corner and stood by the door. The teachers were honestly amazing that day. In addition to my story, one of the teachers likely saved the running kid's life. We'll call him Wayne from now on. Wayne had kept running all the way until we got outside this teacher's room. We'll call the teacher Mr. Simon. Mr. Simon did the same thing my teacher had done, except that he also had a bulletproof vest handy in his wall locker. Again, Small white suburban school, no idea why he felt it was necessary. Very smart man, and in no way nutty, just careful I guess. He put it on, unlocked his now locked door, and pulled Wayne into his room. He locked the door behind him. Another teacher called Harry, then chased him from the building. Harry happened to be a rather large football coach. He was the study hall monitor and initially chased the shooter out of the cafeteria as well. He stopped to check in on the boys, and when he realised that the shooter was still pursuing someone, he left and started chasing him down. I know he was shot at at least once, because my friend says that he jumped behind a vending machine to avoid it. Next time we were in school, no more vending machine. I guess that the shooter was out of bullets, and by the time he chased him out the building, he went to the back and sat with the boys until paramedics arrived. I will never be able to express my gratitude for what he did for me and my friends that day. Even though they were probably already gone, just the fact that he was there was nice to know. It was just so surreal. One minute it was all screaming, and the next I was just sitting where I normally sat at 8.15. I ended up throwing up a few hours later, once the adrenaline had worn off. Since then, I've had problems with both opiates and sleeping aids, though I managed to kick both of these habits before college. I still have flashbacks from time to time, and some nightmares, but at least I can sleep. It only gets bad around the anniversary, and sometimes when I see other shootouts in the news. Sandy Hooks was a rough time for a lot of my former classmates. I still never sit with my back to the door, unless I absolutely have to. I still jump at the sound of gunshots, and cars that backfire every once in a while. I am relatively lucky. I was really only close with one of the guys that was killed, and I spoke a fair bit to the other two. 
It absolutely destroyed some people, I know. Heroin and pills have already killed one, and I see it slowly destroying another every time I check my Twitter feed. Other friends still have trouble sleeping, and I still get semi-regular calls just to talk about PTSD. It's terrible. I still hate being home from college. I don't think I really get out of my funk until I'm out of town. The worst was probably the fact that we were officially back in school by Friday, when the shooting was on the Monday. Just being back in the building was poison. We didn't get shit done for at least a month. Even the kids who were not directly affected. I don't know who was responsible for that decision, but I would punch them in the face if I had a chance. My mother once told me this. In the early 90s, she worked second shift at a plant. The shift ended at midnight, and quite a few of them would go hang out at the local Waffle House afterwards. This particular night, she had hung around the diner until about 2am, and she decided to swing by the post office and check her mail before heading home. We live in a then rural southern town in the US, and there is less than zero traffic at that time of night, and the post office is fairly secluded. She pulls into the parking lot, and under the street light could make out a very old car. Someone is sitting in the car, but this is a small town in America, so she doesn't think anything of it. She retrieves her mail, and walks outside sorting it through. Just as she's about to get into her car, she hears a voice, deceptively weak. It was quiet but carried far. Excuse me, dearie. Could you help an old lady? She hesitated. It was a small rural town where nothing ever happened. But something about the situation just didn't feel right. She could see a person in the car. A tall, thin person wearing an old 40s era dress that hung loose on the frame. A pillbox hat, complete with a veil that hid the face, which was further obscured in shadows. The hands were covered in gloves. Her brain said that this was a frail old woman, but her gut instinct said that something was wrong. The figure held up its hand curled into claws and gestured towards the dash. I have arthritis, the falsetto weak voice said, and my mail has fallen into the crack. My mother could see the envelopes, that they sat where the windshield met the dash. To reach them, she would have to lean far into the car. A small dog yapped as the woman carried on in her falsetto voice. I just can't seem to reach it. She swayed for a moment before spinning and booking it to the car. The car window had been rolled down, so even after slamming the door she clearly heard the falsetto voice. As it rose into angry baritone, Where are you going, you goddamn whoring bitch? She spun out of that parking lot faster than she'd ever driven and peeled rubber for the local sheriff's department. She claims headlights followed her until she made the final turn into the sheriff's parking lot. She gave her statement, and over the years she's heard that several people have seen this man dressed as an older woman, usually seen and avoided, but no one else has ever interacted with him and reported it. Perhaps none of those survived. When I was 19, I was in a serious relationship with a biker. He was twice my age, and I was completely naive to the realities of 1% of biker life. I saw a big, haggard guy who could protect me and toss me over his shoulder as if I were a doll. I was just misunderstood and wanted a family to belong to. I won't bore you with all the details. But one night, I became acutely aware that he had participated in a murder earlier that night. I learned this whilst in his arms in bed with him in the middle of the night with no way to leave.
the full extent to how over my head I was finally hit me. I spent the rest of the night lying awake in panic, trying to figure out how to end things without being fed to the clubhouse lion. Oh yes, they had a lion. I managed to get out okay, but in a bizarre twist of fate, that boyfriend was later killed in what would be Ontario's largest mass murder, known as the Shedden Massacre. This happened in 2014. I'm a senior in high school and would be graduating this year. I remember feeling dreadful and not wanting to go to school because somehow I knew something bad was going to happen. After arguing with myself to whether or not go to school, I text my friends and decided to tell my mum that I wouldn't be going today, as we'd only be watching movies at school and eat free food given out by the teachers. I convinced her and went to sleep. Two of my friends also told me that they would not be going. Then I received a text from my dad and friends that came from the school, saying, The school is on lockdown. All students and staff are to remain inside class. The police are on their way. A student was allegedly threatening all staff with a weapon in his hand. It's not uncommon for our school to go into lockdown. It's happened twice in the last five years. At first, my school wasn't as bad as it is right now. We had student council, and we looked up to them to regulate school rules and always are the ones to stop fights or anything that will harm the students. When the seniors who were all part of the student council graduated, everything turned sour. My school was then reported for drug dealers, fights in schools, and my school wanting to fight with another school and bomb threats. I can recall events where police were escorting a student a year below mine. So this wasn't anything that was surprising, except for the last bit. I read it again, to make sure I was reading it right, and I was. The next day, my friends who were at school told me what happened. Apparently, a guy who's six foot tall went on a rampage with a teacher because she told him that he would not be graduating as he hadn't done enough work this year. The creepy thing, though, was that he was in the same year as me. I often used to see him at school, and he looked harmless. He broke the school's window in the 700 block, went to the cooking class and grabbed a kitchen knife as a weapon, threatened everyone that he was about to kill them. They called the police and made the students go to their class and remain in class until the police got to the school. Fortunately, there were brave students that knew how to defend themselves and decided to imprison the student into a closet slightly taller than the students. Someone managed to kick the knife out of his hand and pushed him into a closet and locked it until the police arrived. I don't know what happened after that. There were rumours that he was put in jail, suspended, expelled, or went to another school. It was a good thing that I wasn't there. Many times my instinct has saved me from danger, and this is one of those times that I am grateful. When I was 17... I was always in Yahoo chat rooms. I was always chatting with people in the local Seattle rooms. Well, this one guy and I chatted a lot and decided to meet. We met at a Herfie's for lunch and when he showed up, it was obvious the guy had lied about everything. The age, what he looked like. The guy even admitted that he lied about having a job and he shows up to Herfie's on the bus. So we eat and I say it was nice and then I have to go. As I walk away, this guy starts following me. I walked to a burger joint because I didn't live very far and I didn't want this guy to follow me home. My mum was a flight attendant and was out of town. My mum had about a week left until her days off from flying. So I really didn't want this weirdo knowing where I lived. I started telling the guy I had some appointment to take care of to try and shake him off from following me. But he insisted it was okay and would go with me for the company. Not knowing what else to do, 
I stopped at a bus stop and waited for the bus to downtown Seattle. He stopped too and got on the bus with me. The whole ride he kept trying to talk to me, asking me all sorts of questions. I would answer with the bare, bare minimum and fill in with lies because I didn't want him to know anything about me now. At one point he tried putting his arm around me and I just leaned away. So he tried putting his hand on my thigh and I told him I didn't know him well enough for him to touch me. I felt sick to my stomach the whole bus ride, trying to rack my brain with what the hell I do once I got downtown. Once downtown, I walked over to the building where my best friend's mother worked. Since I knew the layout of the building, I could play it off. I told him I had to use the restroom. I asked the woman at the cafe if I could use the restroom, and she agreed. So there's a service delivery door outside that leads to this hallway, and this hallway has doors that lead to all the different shops and a service elevator to take things slash merchandise to the other shops on the other levels. So I exited the cafe through the back door and into the hallway, and left the building out the door next to the docking bay. I took this as my chance to make my way to a bus stop to go home. I was going to take the express bus, and just get off at the airport instead of the other bus that takes forever. Well as I make my way to the bus stop, I see the guy in the cafe still waiting for me. I managed to make it onto the bus, and never saw the guy again. However, a few nights later I was on Yahoo chat again, when someone messaged me and I told him I wanted to see a picture to know who I was talking to. He sent one. I see the picture and instantly pick up the phone and call one of my friends. The friend I call, his mum and aunt were really good friends with my mum and aunt, and our grandmother had been close friends too, back in eastern Washington before either of us were born. So he answered and I started talking to him. Hey, are you on Yahoo chat right now? No, why? Someone is trying to talk to me, and they gave me a picture of you claiming it was them. Well, I go back to talking to the guy online, and he admits that it's not a picture of him. He admits who he is, and he said that he felt we had a great connection, but lost me when we went downtown. He started to profess his love to me and everything. I cussed at the guy, and told him I lost him on purpose. Then I changed my Yahoo name and never met anyone from Yahoo chat room in person ever again. Creepy, intelligent, clingy guy, please, let's never meet again. I was in my American history class at the time when the shooting happened. The shooting took place in the main office of the school, and my class was to the far left of the school. It was during lunch hour, but my class had already came back off lunch. At the time of the shooting, I had earbuds in because we were working on a project for class. My friend bumped me and told me that we were in code red and we had to do the procedural stuff. Lights off, no one in sight of the windows or the door and everyone sitting on the ground, no one talking and no cell phones. The no talking rule always gets broken because people always want to hear about what the other people think is going on. The year of the shooting I was a freshman, the shooter was a senior, and had been suspended due to doing donuts in the parking lot. He left school, did some K2, and came back with his father's loaded handgun, and shot the vice principal and the principal. The principal survived, but the vice principal did not. The student left the building and drove somewhere, parked, and took his own life. Sad thing was that the vice principal had a son that taught at our school. I didn't have him as a teacher, but he took a few weeks off after the shooting. And all the while I was working on my American history project, not knowing what happened until someone announced on the intercom what had happened. After a couple of hours of being in code red, police started to escort classrooms outside the building. Rough next couple of days for some time. I was once getting the late train home from work. It wasn't packed, but all the seats were taken, 
so I had to stand by the carriage doors. It's worth mentioning that I am a dwarf. At the second stop, a group of rowdy and evidently intoxicated guys get on by the next set of doors down, and they instantly clock me. One of them points at the aisle and goes, Hey look guys, there's a midget in a kind of stage whisper that carries on across the whole carriage. Quite a few people sitting down also turn and look at me. I'm tired and have no energy to deal with this. So I just stare pointedly at the doors in front of me, pretending not to notice. Hey pal, I see them waving to me from the corner of my eye and I reluctantly turn to acknowledge them. Come here. Come here. I've never met a wee man before. I want to talk to you, pal. He beckoned me eagerly, and the other guys laughed and nodded in encouragement. I smiled uneasily, and shook my head, and looked back at the doors. Bad move. What the hell, man? What's wrong? I'm just being friendly. He starts coming up to the aisle next to me. He's not going to eat you, laughed one of the other guys. The man comes up to me, crouches down, and heavily puts an arm around my shoulder. Can I just get a picture? I've never met a midget before. Just a pic? I hate strangers taking my picture but I was worried that he would turn hostile if I didn't. So I said yes, and he got his phone out and took a selfie. My one act of defiance was putting on a very irritated and fed up expression as he took it. Hopefully something for him to look at after he sobered up. He seemed pleased. He kept heavily patting me and ruffling my hair. Thanks, pal. Thanks, my wee pal. His friends came down the aisle to join us. They all started playing with me until they got off. The first guy acted like I was his pet or something, patting me, and at one point even just rested his hand on my head. I felt belittled, and I felt so upset. I just remained passive though. I didn't want to get confrontational, so I just did what I had to do to keep them happy. I think it's hard for people who are tall to understand just how someone feels when they're belittled and there's absolutely nothing they can do about it. I was so relieved when they finally got off the train. If I hadn't have played along in the end, I'm sure this story would have turned out rather differently. I'm a karaoke DJ. I usually get home between 2 and 3 a.m. But tonight, I got off around 11, because the bar had a power outage. I live alone in a triplex behind a house. I live in the middle of a city, but the property I'm on is rather large, so there's a big backyard behind my apartment. As I was coming home tonight, I noticed that my cats were not waiting for me in the window. They can hear my van pulling into the driveway, and I found it weird. Then I noticed that my kitchen light was on. I never leave my kitchen light on. At this point, I was a little freaked out. And that's when I thought I saw movement in my kitchen. I called 911 and the dispatcher told me to lock my van doors and remain in the vehicle and stay on the line. The officer showed up in under five minutes. They parked on the street and walked up to my van asked me to stay quiet and give them the house key. One officer went into the back, and the other used my key to unlock the door. When he opened the door, all was quiet. Then he yelled really loud, telling someone to come out. I heard the police officer that was in the back start yelling, and the other officer ran in to join him. My neighbours had come out at this point, and I was freaking out. It seemed like a long time but they walked a cuffed woman towards me, and it turned out that she was a patron that I had 86 this last weekend. I don't know how she found out where I lived. 
she was hiding in my bedroom closet with a very large knife and a bundle of rope. I don't want to think about what would have happened if I had gone to bed with her waiting for me. I will be taking gun safety courses soon. But really, if I hadn't have been listening to all these stories, I don't think it would have made me this observant. So, drunk idiot that thought she was going to shank me, let's not meet again. Especially after I get protection. It wasn't a shooting as in Columbine, but when I was in the 8th grade, a 7th grader brought a gun to school. He was playing with it in music class while they were watching a Disney movie. The songs from which they would be singing later in their recital. I think it was Aladdin. But anyway, the original guy who brought it in passed it to him, and he was fiddling with it. Later, he ended up dropping it on his desk. It went off, and struck and killed the little boy sitting directly in front of him. So the school went on to complete lockdown. I, as I said, was in 8th grade, and was in algebra on the other side of the school. So no one knew what the hell was going on, because we didn't hear the gun go off. In hindsight, it was awful, because we just used the sudden absence of our teachers to piss around. I knew we had no way of knowing, but this little boy just died, and we were throwing paper footballs at each other. So for a couple of hours we just sat in this room. Our teacher, who was normally this super chill, mild-mannered guy, had been all, no one leaves this room or there will be hell to pay or something like that. So we didn't. I didn't think we even left to use the bathroom. There was one kid who was coming back from a dentist appointment. I don't envy him. The sight of all the police and the tape and the ambulance. I'm sure there was a lot of palpable horror going on. He was not allowed back in school that day. The families of the shooter and the victims were close. And I believe they were even neighbours. A lot of us went to his funeral. He was so tiny. It was heartbreaking. When I was 16, I was very insecure with myself. I had a hard time making friends, and I was basically invisible to boys. I made a lot of friends online in chat rooms. Mind you, this was back in the early to mid 2000s. It was during the summer and I was staying with my sister to watch her kids because she broke her foot at a carnival, and my two nieces and nephew were a huge handful for her. So I got to stay up all night and use the computer. It was pretty lonely, because I'd just moved from my old house, following the divorce of my mother and stepfather, and couldn't really hang out with my friends for a while because of the situation. I spoke to a few guys, even video chatted a few times, but it was all pretty innocent. Until I met a guy from California. He wouldn't tell me his age and wouldn't even send me a picture. But I got the impression that he was an adult, because he told me that he had his own apartment. He claimed his camera was broken. He also had tried to talk to me into coming out to visit him. He told me he would get me a ticket and that we could meet. He told me that I would have the time of my life and that we could do things together. He seemed excited about the fact that I've never been with a boy before. Anyway, after about a week, he convinces me to lift my shirt up so that he can see me. It took a lot of convincing. He was saying things like, Come on, it's only me. Stupidly, I gave in. I didn't really think much about it afterwards, but I never did it again. I continued to talk to him, but when summer was winding down, my sister didn't need help anymore. So I wasn't at her house or able to use her computer. One day, about two weeks before school started back up, my best friend Amanda called and said, Hey, so, I have a question for you. Why am I looking at a picture of your tits right now? 
I was completely floored. For a while, I didn't even know what she was talking about. I didn't even know what to say. I could only ask her what she meant, and she told me that a random guy had sent her an attachment, and when she opened it, it was me. The guy's screen name was the guy I had been talking to. She'd also apparently gotten calls from other people that were friends, because they'd also gotten the picture. Apparently, this scumbag had hacked me. He got my friends list, and my neighbour got the picture. I know because he approached me about it. He was really nice and understanding about the situation. He had a sister about my age, and felt really protective of me. But, oh my god, it was so embarrassing. I begged him not to tell my mother, which he didn't. Amanda had to get into her parents' email profiles, because he had also hacked her list somehow and sent it to everyone on her list. Both her parents had emails with the attachment of the picture. They never found the picture though, and we were able to keep it pretty quiet. The only people who knew were my peers. I eventually got online, and found about a hundred messages from him. I finally messaged back and asked him why, and he said because I hadn't returned his messages. He got mad because I stopped talking to him. I told him that he'd ruined my life, and all he had to say was sorry before he blocked me. He didn't contact me anymore, and he didn't send out the picture anymore. But as far as I know, about 20 or 30 kids I'd gone to school with had all gotten the picture. I was very glad I didn't go to that school anymore. But every time I visited and we went around the town, and I saw people I'd gone to school with, I knew that they knew. They would point and laugh. I was never more glad that I did not have a computer at home. I didn't even use my AIM profile when I visited Amanda's or my sister's house. To the adult man who tried to completely ruin my life when I was in high school, because you felt that I had rejected you, I hope that you got caught somehow. And I hope that no one ever fell for your bullshit again. I hope you went to prison and had all those things that you wanted to do to me done to you. I hope to God we never meet. The shooting at my high school was an isolated incident, so I never felt scared. I was honestly more surprised it happened at all. It was one of those things that could have happened anywhere and no one would have given it a second thought. But because it happened in our parking lot, it made CNN. I went to a high school in a very safe and small town. They called a Code Red, set to start after the first lunch period and before the second. Some of the kids in my class freaked out, since they had never been in school during a Code Red before. My teacher and I calmed everyone down, saying it was probably a medical emergency, and they needed the hallways clears for EMTs. We even joked that it couldn't be a shooter, because what kind of shooter gives a 10 minute warning? So time passes, and they finally give us information. Turns out there was a shooting. A girl who had just started attending our high school, after transferring from an alternative high school, met her ex-boyfriend in the parking lot. He just said he was going to give her some of her things back when he reaches into his backpack and grabs a gun and shoots her four times. Her mother immediately drives the car between the two of them and he kills himself. There are a lot of people who looked scared and went home. I looked at my little sister and said that we were staying because there was no danger for us. She said okay. The girl who was shot survived, and a few months later gave birth to a child. At the time of the incident, the shooter's parents had left him alone for a few days, and he had stopped taking his behavioural medication. That undoubtedly contributed to why the shooting happened. This happened a few months ago, when I was on my way home from my boyfriend's place. I am a small, shy, 20 year old girl, 5 foot 2 and just barely above 100 pounds. It was around 4pm when I got onto a very packed train. 
I couldn't find a seat, so I had to stand by the door. I had to hold on to one of the rails on the journey, and at the next stop, more people climb into the already very full train. I now faced the glass part of the train, and had this tall skinny guy, possibly in his late twenties, stand directly behind me. Suddenly, I felt a little pressure on my butt. I inched forward, filling the little space that there was between myself and the person in front of me. The creep also stepped forward a bit, and pressed his hand on my butt. Being in a packed train with very little room to move anywhere else, I bit my lip and fought my fears, and tried to ignore the creep, who was now squeezing my butt shamelessly. Then I made eye contact with this rather big man in his fifties, and he asked, Are you alright? I shook my head, and the man got up, gave me his seat and grabbed the creep by the front of his shirt and yelled, Can't you see she isn't interested? Leave the girl alone, and slammed the creep into the handrail as the train stopped at the next platform. I never got to thank the man as he got off from that stop, and thankfully, the creep got off the stop before mine. I met this girl through a mutual acquaintance. I knew that things were not going to work well, as far as relationships went anyway. Put simply, she wasn't all that intelligent. With that being said, she was 18 and pretty, so I flat out told her that I wasn't interested in a relationship, but we could hang out. We spend the day together, and I drop her off home. Turns out home is a rickety old farmhouse out in the middle of nowhere, and she lives with her grandparents. Okay, fine and dandy, but right when I'm about to say goodnight, she unbuckles her seatbelt and basically throws herself across the car and starts making out with me. I already made it clear that I didn't want a relationship, but hey, cute girl makes out with me, what can I do? So we're kissing, groping, and things are getting hot and heavy. When we're done, I barely zip myself up, and three seconds later, her grandfather walks out of nowhere and basically teleports up to my driver's side door. Well, you must be Andy, he says. Uh, yeah, I stammer, shaking his hand awkwardly. I have no clue how he knew my name. Probably the girl told him. I awkwardly walk her to the door, with the grandfather in tow, and headed back to my car and left. Then came the creepy part. A night later, I'm sitting at home playing some piano when my phone goes off. It's a text from a number I don't recognise, but I soon see who it was. It read, I watched you and my granddaughter. Do you think that's appropriate? I didn't respond. Two days later, I get another text. Sandra baked you a cake. You should come over. I didn't respond. Later that day, I get a text from the girl. My grandfather really wants to hang out with you. I never responded to the girl or her grandfather. And about two months later, I get one more out of the blue from him. Going hunting. You should come. Come. Spelt C-U-M. That's how he spelt it. And now, I have a new phone number. Back when I was in first year, I was sitting in maths class, third last period of the day. About 15 minutes into the class though, bang. We were jolted out of our maths induced comas by the sound. The classroom was situated on the top of an old staircase, which amplified the sound which also happened to have emanated just from the bottom of the staircase in an adjoining hallway. The teacher told us to stay in our seats and walk to the next class to find out where this aforementioned bang had originated from. It was then announced over the intercom that all students were to remain in their class for the rest of the day. We spent the rest of the day up there, doing our homework and speculating what the hell the sound had been. 
when the end of the day came, we were escorted by buses. Usually we could walk down unattended on this long detour round the school, whereas we usually would have made the journey in about 30 seconds. This one took two minutes. First sign of trouble was seeing three marked police cars at the front of the school. Second sign was seeing two officers with MP5 submachine guns standing by one of the main student entrances. The third and final and most damning sign of trouble was the fact that of the four large plain glass windows to some of the front facing classrooms, two had been completely shattered inwards. On the bus home, further speculation suggested it had been a bomb. Others said it was a massive firework of some kind. Some of my friends had been closer to the source of the explosion and said that one of the teachers had a breakdown later on. The next day, the window had been repaired, but an area of the school was still damaged. There had been lockers beside a small set of stairs and double doors in front of the steps. The doors were splintered and the lockers no longer there. It eventually emerged that the source of the explosion had been quite a large firework, which the school seniors had fashioned with a time delay fuse somehow using cigarettes or something that allowed them to detonate it when no one would actually be in the vicinity. To many, this probably seems quite mundane, but big fireworks are seriously dangerous. It's quite fortunate that no one happened to be in that area at the time when the idiots decided to set it off. Unfortunately, no one was expelled, even though it is such a stupid thing to do. So there was this guy I found in a chat room when I was around 12. The guy's name was Mike. He lived in California and apparently had a thing for younger girls and was well aware of how old I was. He claimed he was only in his 20s and since it was Yahoo, there was an icon indicating I had a webcam. Mike wanted me to send him dirty pictures of myself in return for pics of himself and asked for my number. Being that I was 12 and wanted attention from guys, I didn't think anything of it at the time. Then things started to get even weirder. He would send me pics, never of his face though, if you know what I mean. Mike told me he was willing to get a job down here, move and pretend to be my mother's boyfriend. He revealed that he wasn't actually 20 he was actually 36. This was over the phone. I told him it was too much. He then began to ask me to do things to myself over the phone. I was afraid that he possibly knew where I lived and was scared to tell my mum what I'd gotten myself into. Then something happened that ended Mike's perverted calls. Being as it happened 14 years ago, there was still dial up and whilst I had a phone in my room, there was a phone still in the living room as well as my mother's room. Mike usually would call around 3.30 when I was getting home from school because my mother worked an hour away and he knew that she wouldn't be home closer until 5pm. Well, he called and I answered and my mum ended up coming home early and needed to use the phone. I did not tell her I was already on it, so she picked up the phone and heard the things that he was saying to me. And she said, excuse me, who is this? Do you realize that the girl you are talking to is only 12? He hung up and never called back. Mike, I hope no one else had to deal with your sick behind. And I hope we never meet in real life. My great uncle John came from Ukraine to visit us in Canada. He had a lot of stories, but this is the one that stood out for me the most. John was traveling by train from his village to another to visit his family. He had to change trains at one point and was dropped off to what amounted to a hut in the middle of nowhere next to a platform. There was no one else at the station and other than a dirt road that led off into the surrounding woods, 
there was nothing there. He waited for some time, but no train came. It was winter, and getting colder and darker. And it was just around the time where he was starting to worry about a place to stay and food to eat. When an old woman appears out of the twilight, seemingly by chance. She asked if he was waiting for such and such a train. And when he said he was, she said it wasn't going to be along until the following day. She asked if he needed a bed for the night and offered him a meal and a room at her house, which she said was about an hour's walk from the station. Lodging with locals was more or less the standard when traveling in this part of the USSR and Great Uncle John wasn't looking forward to a hungry night on a cold platform. So he gladly accepted her offer. He took his suitcase and they set off together down the dark road into the forest. And by the time they arrived at the woman's small two-story house, John was tired and hungry. They went inside. The woman lit some oil candles and warmed some food for them. It was the first time John was able to see the woman clearly and he was a bit surprised to realize that she was actually a man. Not wanting to pry and too tired to care, John finished his soup and asked where he would be sleeping. She led him upstairs to a tiny room with a window and a single bed, nothing else. He thanked her and she said goodnight. Then she closed the door and locked it, leaving him in the dark. Somewhat creeped out by this, John called out to her, but she didn't answer and he heard nothing. Figuring he would deal with it in the morning, and that she probably did it by mistake, John set his suitcase down and laid on the bed, deciding to make the best of it and get some sleep. Before he could fall asleep though, he felt the urge to pee, and got out of bed, hoping to find a chamber pot or something that he could pee in. He got onto his hands and knees, and felt underneath the bed in the darkness, thinking that there might be a chamber pot there. Instead, he found a body. Nope. So he went to the window to check if he could exit from that room, and it was nailed shut. He knew that if he remained in that room, he was a dead man. But if he broke the window and tried to go out that way, there was a good chance that the old woman, and who knows who else was there, would hear him and come into the room before he could get away. He did the only thing he thought he could. He pulled the body from under the bed, heaved it onto the mattress and then covered it with a blanket. He then got onto the bed and waited. Sure enough, about an hour later, he heard footsteps coming slowly up the stairs and then towards the room. The lock clicks and the knob slowly unturns in the gloom, John saw someone move towards the bed. Then he heard several terrific and thudding sounds. The person had bashed the body into the bed with a large crowbar, which then had dropped to the floor in front of John. There was silence. Then the person went out the room and the door was shut again. The footsteps went down the stairs and then there was silence. John moved out from under the bed took the crowbar and was able to slowly pry the windows open. He didn't say, but I imagine that he was shitting bricks the entire time. When the window was up there, he threw his suitcase out and then dove through himself, not caring what was below him, but worried about what was behind. He landed without too much injury and began to run up a field behind the house towards some lights in the far distance. It turned out to be a highway with some military and transport trucks on it, and John was able to get a ride to another village where he would catch the train. He didn't bother reporting what had happened to the authorities, since at that time in the USSR, there was a distinct chance he would have been the one who got in trouble. He just thanked God that he escaped, and decided that next time he traveled to visit relatives, he would take another way.
When I was a junior in 98, I was in the office applications class when the school went on lockdown. We didn't know at first what had happened. I remember someone coming to the door and motioning for my teacher to come speak with him. After a few moments of hushed discussion, the man left and my teacher shut and locked the door. She went to the front of the class and in a very somber voice she explained to us that we were going to be staying in the class until the end of the day and maybe even longer if the police wanted us to stay put. We asked her what was wrong and she got choked up and made a weird sound, a cross between a sob and a cough. She told us with tears in her eyes that a boy named Nick Creason had been shot outside and that it didn't look like he was going to make it. A few girls in the back of the class began gasping and some of them started crying. One of their friends was a girl named Tanya who was Nick's girlfriend at the time. They all knew each other. Apparently Nick had been falling out with this other guy Jacob Davis over Tanya's affections. Jacob had gotten angry that she was seeing this other guy after dumping him so he confronted him about it in the parking lot. He shot him there with a rifle and Nick died in hospital. Three lives were ruined that day. Nick's, which was forever lost, Tanya's, who was never the same again after that, and Jacob, who is now serving life in prison, not to mention the family of the three of them. All of that over a girl. Even when I was a know-nothing kid of a girl in high school, I knew that no boyfriend or girlfriend was ever worth committing murder for. But I'd never had to walk in anyone else's shoes, so I don't know what goes on in the minds of those angry people. I just wish it had never happened. It was right after Columbine, and it put our sleepy town school on the map and in the public eye. It's selfish and strange of me, but I'm glad I didn't personally know any of the people involved. It was easier to deal with by distancing myself from it. It made it seem less real. I had been drinking beers and was getting too drunk for my taste. Tired as well, it had been a long day, so I pulled out my bag of MDMA, opened it and started shaking some of it into my beer. When my friend looks at me and says, but that's MDMA. I'm not sure, but I think we were talking about LSD at that moment. I smile and tell him, yeah, obviously, whilst I kept shaking this stupid bag. I realized I put in a bit too much, but I figured I'd just not drink the last bit. Next thing I remember is the rancid taste of the last bit of beer with too much MDMA in it. I remember thinking, oh boy, here we go. Next thing I know, I wake up from a muscle spasm in my car with no recollection of what happened. I don't feel too bad or tired. I just get out and head back to the party. My friends are just grinning and told me that absolutely everybody noticed. No one ever told me what the hell I did that night, but I'm sure it was pretty crazy. Hey guys, it's Mort here and thank you so much for listening. I hope you all had a very lovely Christmas indeed. It would mean the world to me if you could show this video some love by leaving a like and a comment as it goes a long way. And why not consider sharing it with a friend or someone who you think will enjoy it. Just a reminder that you can get into the holiday spirit with my new merchandise which can be found in the description, along with the links to my social media, as well as my Patreon, if you're feeling extra generous. If you'd like me to read your story on my channel, feel free to send it to my email or share it to my Reddit page. And please make sure to include as much description and punctuation as possible to maximize the chances of it being read. But anyway, for now guys, I'm going to sign off. Stay awesome, and I'll see you 
in the next one.